I'm so glad we did. I want to talk about the glorious liberty this morning. Usually something happens along the line of what I'm going to be preaching about to help emphasize what I'm preaching on that week. And I was talking to somebody this week and I said, you just don't have a great enough desire. And when we think about the Lord and our glorious liberty, we ought to have a great desire to go and be with Him. That's got to be the preeminent thing on our heart and on our mind. I know it is on mine and I know a lot of it has to do with all the study I do. But I have that great desire to be with the Lord. And we're not going to get to heaven and think we're going to sort of slide in the gate and crawl along the wall and find a place for a corner for us to be in. We're going to have to be ready to go in. Be ready for this. This great change. And realize what it means to be set free. Especially from us in here. Set free from our disabilities. Our inabilities. The things we can't understand. Things we have to go through in life. And know that in that liberty, we're going to be in perfect shape. We're not going to be struggling and striving with the very things that limit us today. Reading from Romans, the 8th chapter, beginning at the 21st verse, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of the corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. What a glorious liberty. Coming out of the corruption that we see all around us. We know that our government today is going through a very troublesome time. There's a lot of corruption in government. We know that around our homes, a lot of them are in trouble today because there's a lot of corruption in the homes. And we know in our own lives there are things that are deteriorating and we have to fight and struggle with and our own bodies tell us that we have another day coming where we're going to be delivered from these struggles. We got to be ready to walk into that glorious liberty that the Lord is given us. He's paid the very costliest price. The very costliest price He could for us. You know what He said? It's worth it for the joy that was set before Him. He endured the cross despising the shame, the mockery, the spitting on him, the pressing the crown of thorns in his head, some idiot of a soldier taking a a scepter, whatever that was they gave him for the scepter, and beating him in the head of thorns, with those prickly thorns going into him. Just beat him in the head. And they didn't realize he was the king of glory. 
He was the very one that sat on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. One thief on the cross said, If you be the Lord, get yourself down from here and take us with you. Well, what right would he have to claim that? He didn't ask for forgiveness. He wasn't seeking God's will. He didn't want nothing to do with God. He just wanted to get out of what he is in. The other thief said, Don't you realize that we're in the same fix as him, but he's not deserving to die? We are. And we're going through this pain today. But God is setting us free. What a wonderful thought in this glorious liberty. Going to the first section, the hidden mystery, 1 Corinthians 2 and 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden mystery, which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of the world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. Do you love Him today? The question you have to ask yourself, do I love Him today? But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Shelly, can you come turn this microphone on? I'm trying to preach and I feel myself straining and I realize my microphone phone ain't on. There we go. Wait a minute now, Doug. It ain't on. Well, maybe it was on. It just didn't seem like it. I guess it is on. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man, which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Think about this hidden mystery now. Paul's saying, we got this hidden mystery that the Spirit of God teaches us. Jesus told the disciples after he'd come back to life before he ascended to heaven. He said, go and wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. The Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost and filled all of them that were in the upper room. Since that day, we've had the spiritual outpouring that has helped us along our way. 
and leads us and guides us. But there's a second outpouring of the Spirit that's yet to come, I believe. Now, be in this last days, we'll need it. We'll need the touch of God to endure to the end. But thank God for the grace that's been given to us that we can know the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is not bound, but it's in the Word of God, all through the Word of God. The, the prophets of old that were false prophets, it says in the Old Testament that even if they were false prophets, if they took the Word of God and taught it by the spiritual meaning that it had, they would have accomplished God's will in their lives. People don't realize the will of God is the most important thing that we can have in our life. And today, people are going their own way. They're not thinking about God's will be done in their lives. But every time somebody asks me to pray for them, I tell them quick, I'm going to pray for the will of God in your life. And I know that's the best thing that you can have is the will of God. It's a hidden mystery. It is God that justifieth. Romans 8.24 For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If he spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. How many times in life have we heard someone say or thought it ourselves? Well, that fellow's got a long way to go to get to heaven. But you know, when the calling of God gets on our life, God takes care of things. And He leads us very specially along the way. He'll be putting people in our paths that'll guide us. He'll put His Word before us that we can study. 
and he'll lead us as the great shepherd. He's not as the foolish shepherds of the Old Testament. They kicked and beat the sick and the weary sheep and become idle shepherds. He's a good shepherd. And he said, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He said, I know my sheep. My sheep know my voice. And another they will not follow. That makes it pretty plain, don't it? We got to have a desire to serve the Lord. Otherwise, we're among those that are cut off. And he said, if we don't have the fruit on the vine, we'll be like the branches that are taken away and burned. And you see, that makes us realize, God, whatever it takes, prune this vine. Cut back the dead and the withering branches so that my vine can produce fruit. And we should have a desire for fruit of the Spirit. God's trying to lead us along this way. I know it seems like this is just an activity and this is just a church service. But you know this is special to God. He said where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. And if the King of glory wants to take the time to sit in on our services and have fellowship with us, we surely ought to have a passion and a desire to serve Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Like I said, if I was going to marry a woman, she better have passion for me. She better have desire to be with me. And the Lord can tell if you have that desire to be close to Him. He can tell if you're withdrawing yourself away from Him or trying to draw close to Him. He can tell if you're trusting Him through your hardships and loving Him with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your might. He said, if a man is going to follow up after me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Got to have the desire to serve God. It's him that justifies, not we ourselves. It's not our own worldly efforts, but it's the spiritual. We got to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. Always abounding. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, 
the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you have, know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I read these words and I think about one of our nurses whose name is Daniela. She goes by the name Danny. You may remember her coming through at night and in the early mornings, bouncing around here with energy like the Energizer Bunny. She's so funny the way she walks down the hall in such life. And every time she comes into the room, seems like the room just brightens up with her spirit because she's there to do whatever we need and she's not whining and crying about her work to do but she runs toward it faces it head on and we know we can trust her I love that I love that about her and it makes me think we ought to be abounding for the Lord with that same energy that same love that same Desire now, I know we're old and tired and we can't help a lot of things, but you can still do your best. You can still do your best. Your best might be the least among us, but it's okay with God. He loves your best. We got to be steadfast, unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Think about it. Our change is soon coming. And we're going to be going in to that glorious liberty. Whether it's through death or whether we're caught up to meet Him in the air. Either way, we step off of this life into the next. Either through uh, incorruption or through immortality. Either way our change comes. And what a wonderful thought to know that we're going to be with the Lord forever and ever. Paul said it like this, to be with the Lord, I'd rather be. But to be with you is more needful. He said, but I'm on a glory in the cross, waiting for that day when I'm gone. I'm telling you something. I wish I could preach this message with the excitement I feel about the coming of the Lord. The desire that I feel in my heart bubbling up, wanting to do more for God. I wish that I was able to do more. The more I can do, the more I want to do. I've been testifying online to people around the world, some over in Kenya, some in Pakistan, some in the Philippines. And they're saying, please come minister to our church. And I say, I can't. I have a broken neck. I'm in a nursing home. I've been disabled for 21 years. And they can't hardly believe it. But I can tell you, I believe it. I'm the one experiencing it. But I'm glad that I've been able to do more than they imagined. They don't understand what paralysis does. But it limits. But it's all right. God is not limited. In conclusion, Romans 8.34 Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress 
or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How wonderful. I've heard people say, well, you just wait till the Antichrist gets here. If you can't serve God, you'll never serve him. When the Antichrist gets here, let me tell you something. You don't even have to fear him. He's nothing but a thing. Nothing but a thing to come. And we don't have to fear no man, no angel, nor any other creature. Because God will carry us through until he calls us home. And I think about that. And I'm thinking about we don't live by the fear of man. We live by the fear of God. We don't think of them that can destroy the body and after that do no more. But we think about him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And we live in the fear and respect of him for who he is. He's our Lord that gave himself for us. You know, he went all the way. He didn't back up one minute. And he, he didn't think for one second that he was going to do any less. In the garden when he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Amen, if it's possible for me to do all I've got to do, let it pass. Nobody wants to jump into this kind of stuff. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured it to the end. And that's why he said, He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this Christmas season. We thank you for thinking about the Lord who came to earth in the form of a child in Bethlehem's manger and was poor so that we could be rich. He suffered so that we could live in Him. And He rose again showing us the way that we can rise again. And Lord, I'm longing to come see You. I don't want to sneak in the gate and try to get by somebody because none of us are going to sneak in. But I want to come in triumphant. Triumphant knowing I've served the Lord and I've loved Him and He's kept me all the way. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Last week, I kept playing the video not realizing that I'd never turned it off. And it took an extra 15 minutes of me going around visiting people.